So. Martin wants you to know that we should all be saying L'chaim and relaxing, take it easy. This is going to be fun. Right. And good, L'chaim, L'chaim. Okay, tonight's topic is Judaism's most notorious individuals and the lessons that we can learn from them, from their lives. And uh, we'll be doing it in two parts. The first part will be done by Rabbi Zach Gomo and the second part by Mendel Heller. So, Zach, take it away. Thank you so much, Rabbi Heller. Um, and I am going to speak about a few individuals this evening, um, some who might be a little bit more expected and some a little bit less. I think the first one's probably going to be the least expected of all. And it's a gentleman um, who you might know from his official title, which was brotherly leader and guide of the revolution of the great socialist people's Libyan Arab Jama Rabia. And that was, of course, one Muammar Gaddafi. Now, Muammar Gaddafi claimed to have no official political power. He claimed to just be a popular figurehead, inspiration to the people of Libya and the world. But in reality, anybody that knows much about Gaddafi knows that for almost 40 years, from 1969 until 2011, he was the absolute dictator of Libya. And he was a pretty bizarre guy. He had a personality cult based on himself um, and a book that he wrote called The Green Book. This was a small book which has been described as, and I'll quote, a racist, incomprehensible bunch of nonsense. Uh, this was a book that he had broadcast 24 hours, seven days a week on Libyan TV was compulsory learning for Libyan school children who had to study it and were tested on it for hours on end. And in honor of his green book, he literally changed the flag of Libya to a solid green rectangle. The only solid colored flag in the history of the world. He crowned himself King of Kings of Africa, and he often wore quite outlandish and bizarre costumes, if anybody looks dressed, and uh, a lot of medals, almost all of which he gave himself. When he went and traveled throughout the world, which he did quite frequently, he always stayed in a Bedouin tent that he brought with him, even when traveling to cities like London or New York, and gave rambling speeches in the United Nations that lasted literally at times hours on end. And for most of the people in the world, Gaddafi was a very humorous joke, but not for the people of Libya themselves. He had a huge military system to protect him, including a bodyguard made up of 40 women at any given time, and he persecuted and killed Libyans with abandon. Despite claiming to be a lover of Africa and Arabs, he killed Arabs and Africans in numbers that are incomprehensible. Um, of his adventures in Sierra Leone, journalist Douglas Farah wrote, the amputation of the arms and legs of women and children as part of a scorched earth campaign was designed to take over the region's rich diamond fields and was backed by Gaddafi, who routinely reviewed the progress and supplied weapons. He funded terrorists throughout the earth of such a variety that I don't think anybody compares. The IRA in, uh, uh, on the island of Ireland, the cannibal dictator of Uganda, Idi Amin, so many groups, mutually exclusive groups that hated each other. He funded and armed for no comprehensible reason. Palestinian terrorists were a key people that he funded and supported. Um, but that didn't stop him killing them as well in Libya and in Lebanon, where he killed them in great number. He also called Yasser Arafat stupid and claimed to oppose both an Israeli and Palestinian state and wanted to instead create his own country called Israeltine, combining the two. Now, despite this, something's very odd. He often throughout his life appealed to Israelis, particularly when he was under pressure and at risk of falling, particularly towards the end of his life. He appealed to Israelis for help, which seems really odd because he also killed them a lot of the time. 
One possible explanation to this, and I want to make emphatically clear, this is not historically concluded fact. This is a myth, a rumor that has some interesting elements to it. It's not a fact. Is that Gaddafi may have actually been from of Jewish descent. And what indicates this is that Libya was and remains a highly tribal society. And everybody in Libya can identify themselves and others by their tribal links. Gaddafi often appeared to not have any, which was very suspicious to people. There was a rumor in Libya for years that Gaddafi was Jewish, and he would kill anyone who made this claim that he became aware of, including his own ambassador to Italy, who he murdered for making this claim. A very specific suggestion is made by a family of Libyan Jews living in Netanya today. The matriarch of the family, Gitta Baron, said, and I quote, Gaddafi's grandmother is my grandmother's sister. His grandmother is my father's grandmother. She was Jewish, became Muslim, and married the town sheikh. She had children, and he is her grandson, and so he is considered Jewish because his mother was born to a Jewish mother. He was full of joy and mischief. I saw him on a few occasions when we were growing up. We played together when he visited our home. I saw him before my family moved to Israel. He was seven and I was 13. Now, whether or not Gaddafi was halakhali Jewish, whether that's true or not, is an interesting little historical side point, but it's kind of besides the point because there are no shortage of people who we know 100% were entirely 100% halakhali Jewish who did horrible things horrible things. One of these was a gentleman who you might be familiar with named Thomas Tutukamada. Now, we have to go back to medieval Spain. Uh, many people will be familiar with the concept of the golden age of Spain. This is when Islamic emirates controlled, or somebody's got their speak, you might want to mute yourself, it's up to you, just in case you want to hear any, don't want us to hear your private conversation, but it's your call. Um, Muslim emirates control much of what is today Spain and Portugal, and this led to what was seen as a golden age of medieval Jewry. Now, we have to be very clear. People throw that word golden age around a lot. It wasn't like Jews had the freedom or liberty that we appreciate in a society like Australia today. By no means whatsoever. They were still very much second-class citizens. But they had far more rights, safety, privileges, um, and opportunities than in most of Christian Europe at that time. But when um, uh, Al-Andalus, Muslim Spain and Portugal, was reconquered, what was called the Reconquista by Catholic monarchs, things started to go downhill very, very fast. And in particular, Ferdinand and Isabella, this king and queen that basically invented the modern Spain, were um, given advice by the man who married them, their shadchan, in a sense, Lavdil, who uh, uh, kind of suggested their union, who was this Catholic priest named Thomas de Tulcamada. And he said, listen, if you let these Jews stay in Spain, they are going to corrupt your attempt to create this united Catholic society. So you've got to persecute them. And as a result of this persecution, a lot of Jews converted. It's the numbers are notoriously difficult to ascertain, but some estimate as many as 200,000 out of a total population of 300,000 Jews converted to Catholicism in name, in theory. But everybody knew that many of these conversions, probably most of them, were not really genuine. That people in name converted, but in reality, in practice, only married each other, continued to practice Judaism, certainly were not convinced Catholics. So Tukumada recommended to Isabella and Ferdinand to kick out all those Jews who had not converted so that they could not influence the conversos. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that Tukumada himself, emphatically, everybody knows this, was the child of conversos, Jewish uh, uh, converts to Catholicism. And what a lot of people also don't realize is that the inquisition that he then started against uh, people in Spain was not against Jews. The Jews, the, for the formal Jews were all gone. They'd been expelled. These were people who had <coughs> in name at least converted to Catholicism and were now inquired as to if their conversion was genuine. And as we all know, horrific accounts of arrest torture, murder, the, the uh, acquisition of property against these people, all by somebody who was, everyone agrees, halakhically Jewish, if didn't identify as Jewish as all. 
And another example I want to give is, of course, Karl Marx, the intellectual father of communism and socialism. Again, people might not be aware, both of his grandfathers were communal rabbis. His parents converted to Christianity because at that time in Prussia, you couldn't be a lawyer if you were a Jew, and his father wanted to practice law. Despite this, Karl Marx wrote of Jews, what is the worldly religion of the Jew? Huckstering. What is his worldly God? Money. Money is the jealous God of Israel, in face of which no other God may exist. So this is pretty blatant self-hatred, pretty blatant anti-Semitism. And something that's quite shocking is the number of Jews throughout history who've been uh, attracted to communism and socialism and Karl Marx ideas. One of the most zealous communists to have ever lived was a man named Lazar Kaganovich. He was known as Ayn Lazar, and he was one of Joseph Stalin's most loyal supporters and the most senior members of Stalin's regime. When Stalin had his great terror and murdered people and signed the execution, execu execution lists himself, out of 357 of those executions that Stalin signed, 188 were co-signed by Let Lazar. When Stalin accused his own brother, Lazar's own brother, Mikhail, of being a Nazi spy, which was obviously completely and utterly absurd because he was Jewish, doesn't really make sense of past master, Kaganovich made no attempt to defend him. In fact, he would tell people with pride that he gave his brother the gun to commit suicide with. Another thing that Kaganovich did that is quite shocking is he was one of the key people responsible for the Holodomor. People with a Soviet or former Soviet Union background have probably heard of the Holodomor, but many of us, I think, often don't. And it kind of reflects how insidious, how horrific the Soviet regime actually was. This was a man-made famine in the Ukraine in the 1930s that saw, according to various estimates, about three million Ukrainian people starved to death in a man-made famine. This was so bad, and I'm sorry if I'm being a bit shocking here, but I think it's important to illustrate, that cannibalism became rampant. People ate their own children, and human body parts were being sold as meat on the streets. It got so bad that despite causing this famine, the Soviet government printed posters on the streets of the Ukraine that simply said, remember, it is still illegal to eat your children. This is the horror, the true horror of this regime. When, his, when Ka Lazar Kaganovich's wife approached him and said, how can you do this? How can you be part of this? She said he yelled out to her, Stalin is my God. Do you hear me? Hear me good. Now, there's something ironic here. All of these individuals, these halakhically Jewish individuals who committed these horrible, horrible acts had a very strange end. Tulkamada was sidelined before dying in 1498. And in 1832, only two years before the Inquisition officially ended, his bones were dug up and ritually destroyed in a process of the Inquisition known as the Odo de Fe, the Act of Faith, to cleanse heretics. Karl Marx died stateless and penniless in London. He was supposed to have a grand funeral by his supporters. But according to the newspaper, The Graphic, something strange happened. And I quote, by a strange blunder, his death was not announced for two days. And then having taken place at Paris. <coughs> Next day, the correction came from Paris, and when his friends and followers hastened to his house to learn the time and place of his burial, they learned that he was already in the cold ground. But for this secrecy and haste, a popular demonstration would have undoubtedly have been held over his grave, but of course did not occur. Now, Lazar Kaganovich had a very interesting end. When Stalin died, because everybody else recognized that Stalin was this horrible monster, and he did not, he was kicked out of the Communist Party that he so loved. And he spent the final years of his life completely unrepentant, saying Stalin was wronged. 
Israel Singer was, a sent, was the Secretary General of the World Jewish Congress, and he went and visited the LD, Elder Lazar in his Moscow apartment. He later met the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and the Rebbe said to him, and remember the Rebbe himself witnessed the horrors of the Soviet Union, is Kaganovich doing tshuva? Is he repenting? You never know. Maybe he'll repent. When you go back next time, you should tell him he should do tshuva. He should, uh, he should repent. He still has a chance. And actually, Kaganovich died only weeks before the fall of the Soviet Union, never having publicly expressed a single regret. Finally, Gaddafi, and I note, and I make clear, we don't know that he, if he was actually halakhali Jewish, was killed by his own subjects, the people he ruled in 2011 in the Libyan civil war. One out of three Libyans who revolted against Gaddafi said that part of the reason why they revolted against him was because they believed that he was Jewish and that influenced their hatred of him. Interestingly, the Hebrew date of his death was the 22nd of Tishrei, the festival of Shmini Atzeret coming up soon. And we believe that the period of repentance for the previous year extends from Yom Kippur to Hoshana Rabbah, the 21st of Tishrei. Just an interesting little side note there. Now, the idea that the Lubavitcher Rebbe gave that anybody can do tshuva repentance, that it's never too late, is not an idea that came out of nowhere. Not at all. We have many incredible sources far earlier in Judaism of this. And one of the strongest comes from the Gemara, the Talmud in Avodah and it speaks about a man named Rabbi Elazar ben Dudaya. He was an extremely, extremely sinful man, undertook very, very uh, uh, serious sins, um, I'm not going to go into the details here, but if you want to see a story in the Talmud of a uh, uh, woman of ill repute passing gas and then giving moral rebuke, using that as the basis of her explanation, have a look. It's quite fascinating, believe it or not. That is there in the Gemara. And when she did this, he actually repented. He repented so significantly that he died of his repentance. He placed his head, and I'm quoting the Talmud now, between his knees and cried out loudly until his soul left his body. A divine voice emerged and said, Rabbi Elazar ben Dudaya is destined for life in the world to come. Now, he didn't have the title rabbi till that moment. He was this sinful man. But Rabbi Yehuda Nasi remarked about this. There is one who acquires his share in the world to come only after many years of toil. And there is one who acquires his share in the world to come in one moment. Not only are penitents accepted, they are even called rabbi. Now, it would be foolish for us to think what any of these people thought in their final moments of life. Did they repent? Did they not repent? Like Eleazar ben Dudaya, we, are, we will never, ever know. We also don't know how God views that repentance. What we do know is that when discussing Leza Kaganovich, the Rebbe's primary concern, the first thing he said, remember, this is a man who witnessed firsthand the full horrors of the Soviet Union, inflicted on him and his family. He didn't think of revenge. He didn't think of punishment. He didn't think of hate. His primary concern was Kaganovich's ability to undertake tshuva and his absolute conviction that it was still possible. The great Hasid Rabbi Dov Bear, the Maggid of Mezrich, once said, do you hear what they say in the heavenly academy? They teach that you must love the most wicked Jew as you love the most righteous. God judges, we don't. I mean, we do, but we shouldn't. It's not for us to make those judgments. If some of these people, some of these most evil, horrific people in the world, Lazar Kekanovich, is still capable of repentance, what does that mean for those around us? I presume that none of us have in our close proximity people responsible for the murder and cannibalism of millions of people. And furthermore, and I think this is one of the strongest points that I want to give, is that what does this mean about ourselves? Because I think that there is a tendency amongst any of us, or amongst many of us at least, 
to stand at a time like Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, these days of repentance, and to view ourselves as irredeemable. And I think that the message here is that that couldn't be further for the truth. So we have to be kind and understanding with others, but also with ourselves. The gates of repentance are always entirely open. I think I'd be much faster than I intended to be. Um, but that was the crux that I that I that I uh, uh, wanted to say. So um, I, I guess I'll either pa I'll pass over to Ben. You know, you're the strangest rabbi I know. A rabbi that talks less than he intends. I don't know many rabbis <laughs> that do that. I could barely keep my time when I give myself a short amount of time or a long amount of time. Thanks for that uh, great, great one. Um, <clears throat> so thanks for that. F fascinating how um, the Rebbe saw in the light of such difficult characters um, some positivity. And I'm, I'm going to take it a step back in history. Um, so I'll, I'll take it from a similar perspective and obviously the reason why we chose this topic uh, Zach and I we were discussing things that possibly we can do coming closer to Rajana where uh, sometimes we feel as though are you hearing me okay Zach? So, sounds okay? Um, so, uh, sometimes we feel as though uh, perhaps we're, we're not adequate or we're not good enough so if we could look at people that are without a doubt far worse than us and see um, a breath of light for them, then there's without a doubt a tremendous amount of hope for us. Um, that was a, a partial answer to Fritz's great question, so thanks for that one. Um, perhaps we'll elaborate it on it a bit at the end, and, and I'd like to leave room at the end for questions to myself or to Zach. I want to take you through three, three characters as well. <clears throat> and I'll take you back to, first of all, the time of the first temple. Um, we're going to go back to the great great grandson of King David, Chizkiah HaMelech. Now, Chizkiah HaMelech is said to have been the greatest Jewish king besides for King David and King Solomon. Yeah, King Chizkiah Melech. He lives, according to these different calculations, either between 490 BCE or 60, 680 BCE, that, that, that time. He, in the time that he comes, his predecessor makes, uh, causes idolatry to become widespread. Now this is something that you see throughout the first temple era, era from after the time of King Solomon. At the end of the era of King Solomon, the Jewish people split into two camps. The first camp is the kingdom of Judah, the second camp is the kingdom of Israel. I'm not going to get into the story, we'll talk about that another time. What's the story of why those people separated and divided into two separate camps? But Judaism divides into two Separate, separate states, the Jewish people. Now the Kingdom of Israel, unfortunately, really is overtaken by idolatry. And that is the ultimate downfall. Throughout the reign, the hundreds of years of the Kingdom of Israel, there is not a single king that doesn't uh, serve idols and promulgate it, except for the last king, when it's a little bit, little bit too late. Uh, to a certain degree, even though our topic of tonight is that it's never too late. Uh, but we'll, maybe, maybe we'll get back to that in a moment. The kingdom of Judah, on the other hand, that's the Lion of David, and that's where we come from, that's what we call Jews. There's less idolatry, but some it's about half-half. Some of the kings are very idolatrous and some of them are not. King Chizkiah comes and he cleanses the Jewish people from idolatry. Now, he doesn't want to get married. The reason why he doesn't get married is because he's heard of a prophecy about him that if he gets married, he's going to have evil children. And he says, what's the point in having children, getting married and having children, if they're going to be evil? The prophet comes and rebukes him because he's become sick. 
he's become unwell. And he says, you're going to die. Why are you going to die? Because you've refused to get married. And he says, well, I know that if I get married, I'll have evil children. I don't want that. So the prophet, and I believe it was Jeremiah, not Jeremiah, um, Isaiah, says to him, Yeshayah, who says, that, listen, that's not for you to decide. Your job is to do what God tells you. And God wants you to get married. How your children will turn out is not up to you. Anyway, it goes on that he ends up marrying, I think it's the daughter of the prophet, and he has two children in his old age. He's particularly an old individual. And while he was a very, very righteous person, he cleansed the Jewish people of idolatry, um, he perhaps never had as much patience for his children. And he ends up bringing up two children, two sons, which are not of the best character. And there's a there's a midrash about what actually happens to the children at one time he's busy carrying his children on his shoulders up to the temple and they see his bald head and the one child says to the other child wow wouldn't that be a great place to serve baal the famous idol idol worship of the time and Chizkiah, who's spent his entire life uprooting idolatry from the Jewish people, hears it. He takes his two children and he throws them off him. How dare they speak like this to their father about his own head as a place to worship idolatry. Unfortunately, because of the pain, uh, one of the children actually dies. Now, obviously, that was not the intention. It was a mistaken moment of, of anger. That's what, the, um, that's what the one Medrash tells us about how that happened. Menashe ends up, Chizkia lives, uh, he almost, in his era, in his time, the rest of the kingdom of Israel is totally exiled and destroyed by the great king of Assyria known as Sancheriv. He destroys the kingdom of Israel and they disappear from the face of the earth as in they are dispersed amongst the world and that is not, then they become known as the ten lost tribes. They come to Judea to, to conquer the temple and Jerusalem, and Chizkiah is outnumbered. He has no physical, natural chance of, of beating the Assyrian king of Sancheram. There are hundreds of thousands of soldiers against him. Um, so he basically goes to sleep and prays to God. And the next morning he wakes up and a plague had broken out amongst all the troops of Sancheram and they all die. And that's how the kingdom of Judea miraculously survives for another few hundred years, about a hundred years, until its destruction, a hundred years later, by the Babylonians. So a short while later, King Chizkia passes away and he gives over the reins to his 12-year-old son, Menashe. Now Menashe, as a 12-year-old boy, he was at that point badly, terribly influenced by some of the... Uh, leaders and, and youth of the time. He was very young and not prepared for the role and he starts taking the Jewish people in the totally opposite direction that his father had taught them and he starts to promulgate idolatry. He brings back all the idolatrous uh, places that existed before and anybody that tries to fight or work against idolatry or uh, admonish him he actually kills them so much so that he even kills the prophet Isaiah and he ends up doing two major and terrible sins in his time number one he commits a murder and number two he he causes most of the Jewish people or the kingdom of Judea uh, of, uh, of Yehuda of Judea to become to become idolaters so he has a very long very very long reign Manasseh. one the longest reign of any king of israel his kingdom lasts for 55 years um, and in the middle of that kingdom he uh, that rule he uh, gets taken captive by the Ammonites 
And when he's taken ca captive, he starts to see the folly of his ways. And he starts to repent. And eventually he is set free. But when he goes free, unfortunately, the damage that he had done was so severe that by that time, the majority of the Jewish people were already serving idols. It was so deeply entrenched within the Jewish people. And he tried to uproot it, but couldn't. So we believe that by the end of his life, he has made a full circle transformation. And he decided despite all his evil and wicked doings, he actually goes for a full transformation as an individual. But unfortunately, he's not able to transform his entire life for the people, for the, for the Jewish people, and the Jewish people remain engrossed in idolatry. So, there's a lot of details in the Drashim about the life of Menashe. Some people say that foreign policy, he was better than his father. But ultimately, and that's why he lived so long, but ultimately he's considered one of the most evil kings of Judea because of what he'd done. And ultimately the destruction of the temple several generations later is uh, blamed to a certain degree on him because he wasn't able to undo the damage that he had done. So even though he repented, he didn't repent to the same degree as his father. Now, going forward, I want to tell you some two strange stories. Somewhat non-historical type stories. Strange stories. This story takes us about 150 years back. So, from now on. Uh, perhaps a, a bit more. Uh, to the uh, mid-1800s, there's a man by the name of Schmelke of Nicholsburg. Schmelke of Nicholsburg is um, the rabbi of Nicholsburg, the town, and he's got some really strange behaviors, but he's a very righteous and pious person. The community leaders, the board, the committee, they decided that he's too strange for their community and they can't handle him, they're going to be firing him. So they called the local rabbi, they called him the Beadle, and they said to him, we want you to go and tell Reb Shmilke of Nicholsburg that he is being fired and we don't want him any longer. Nicholsburg is not fit for our community. So the Beatle says, I, why are you doing this? He says, well, because we believe that he's not fit for our community. He does strange things. He says, okay, I want to tell you a story. Would you excuse me? I've got another Zoom meeting to get to. No worry. Thank you, Russell, for joining. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. So he Schmelke of Nicholsburg, he says, I'll tell you, you know that every day there was a custom in the time that the every every morning they had somebody that would wake the people up. There wasn't alarm clocks and not necessarily everyone had roosters. So what they would do is they would have a wecker, the beetle that the, the, would go around waking people up. And he goes around, he would go from town to town waking people up. And he says, every morning I go and wake up the rob. But whenever I get there, the rob is already awake. The one morning I decided to peek in and see what's going on and I saw that he was learning with somebody. And my interest, I was so dumbfounded, who's he learning with him all the night? So he asked and I was, and, and, and he said, if I promise not to reveal to anybody, he's learning with Elijah the prophet. Anyway, another day, he says, one other day, I came back and I see that there's two men that he's actually learning with, talking with. And I asked him, who's the second man? Once they left, he said, the, the first man was Elijah the prophet, as you know. The second man was King Manasseh of Judah. So he says, King Manasseh, like, he wasn't such a great man. He says, actually, he'd come down to rectify something that had happened in the town nearby. What had happened in one of the towns nearby is there was a man that went into a church and had destroyed the church and he was killed as a punishment. He was murdered because he destroyed the church, a Jewish man. Now they had a, a um, 
a, a charity that would take care of people that, 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 that lost the, their husbands at a young age, widows and for the burial costs, etc. The widow of this man came begging to the, to the uh, Gemach, to the charity organization, for money. But, but the Gemach refused to give, him any money, give her any money. And they said the reason why they refused to give her money is because he, if we give you money, the, 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 the non-Jewish population will find out that you took care of this widow after, she, after her husband destroyed and could come back to us, so therefore we're not giving you any money. Okay. As a result, he, she took him to another Beth, and another Beth referred the case over to me. And the case was decided, it was decided from the case, that... Um, I didn't know what, what, what to say. Should the charity um, organization be obligated to take care of it? So I didn't know what to do. I was talking with Elijah the prophet about the case that I normally do my my studies. And he told me, actually, you have to today talk to King Manasseh. So King Manasseh came down and appeared as a physical man in a crown. And he said, I want to tell you, this man is actually my reincarnation. And that man was the ultimate rectification for my sins. And he had to go and destroy a foreign, another idolatrous organization. Now, I don't know what the story means. But to me, it sows in some type of connection that we always have to the past. And how there's always a place for rectification. I'm going to, uh, there's a lot more that I want to talk about Manasha, but there's too many, two more people that I want to talk to you about before I, if I have a chance to get back to King Manasha. The next person I want to talk to you about is a man by the name of Elisha ben Avua. Elisha ben Avua is a very, very interesting character. He's a rabbi. He's one of the greatest rabbis. As a matter of fact, he's, he's, primary student is none other than a man by the name of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir is the most quoted rabbi in all of the Mishnah. And that is the primary, and his, one of his main teachers was Elisha ben Avua. So this is some serious rabbi. The Elisha ben Avua has a very strange story. Once when he was a child, a young boy, he had some rabbis come over to his house and they started learning. And when they started learning, the father saw fire coming from their faces. I don't know if it was physical fire, spiritual fire, but he saw they were on fire, so to speak. And he said, this passion fire that these rabbis have, I want my, 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 my child to have that. So he prayed and he gave his child, who at the time was a young Elisha, to these rabbis to teach him. And teach him. No, they did. He became a great, great rabbi. Now, several things happen as he's going after he becomes a great rabbi. Several things happen. The first thing that happens that seems to be his downfall is he goes into what's known as the Pardes. Pardes is a spiritual experience of what happens in the celestial worlds. Now, could you imagine being a physical work person down here on this world and being able to go and glimpse into spiritual realms? Now, we're told in the Talmud that there were four people that, that, that entered Pardes. Who were these four individuals? The first one was Rabbi Akiba. The second one was Ben Azai. The third one was Ben Zoma. And the fourth one was Elisha Ben Avua. These are four great rabbis. Now, what happens to them? Ben Azai, he's a, he's, he was a, a great scholar. He never got married. Tremendous scholar. He enters, he sees this spiritual vision, vision, and whatever happens, a discussion for another time, he dies. Ben Zoma, another tremendous rabbi, he sees the spiritual vision and he goes insane. He loses it. Rabbi Akiva. The Talmud says, Niknas b'shalom b'shalom. He came out the same person that he left. 
And that's why we, one of the reasons why we know of the greatness of Rabbi Akiva, that he was able to withstand such great uh, spiritual experiences and not be damaged by them in a negative way. Elisha ben Avua, the character of our story, he goes in and he comes out and becomes a heretic. So he has this major transformation and he starts denying the Torah. He still teaches the Torah. He still uh, knows all the Torah, but he stops keeping the Torah. The Talmud tells us of a story of he once came, he was once seen in the Beth Midrash riding on a horse outside the Beth Midrash, riding on a horse on Shabbat that was also Yom Kippur eating. And he did it as a show to show that he is not no longer keeping the Torah. He's known as the greatest, so to speak, heretic because of who he became. Another thing we know about him is that he used to actually sometimes kill people that he thought were too becoming too great Torah giants, or too religious. Or if he could, he would send them away to get a trade so that the Jewish people wouldn't have good leaders. Now, I mentioned earlier that he had a teacher, he had a student by the name of Rabbi Meir. So, there's a, an interesting story of once Elisha ben Avu arrives at the Torah Academy, the Beit Midrash, where all the rabbis are studying, and it's a Shabbat afternoon. And Rabbi Meir is sitting there teaching his students, and his old teacher drives by, rides by on a horse. And Rabbi Meir runs out to talk to his old lost teacher. And he says to his, and, and they start walking and discussing Torah. This is the great Rabbi Meir, who has definitely never lost it. And he's walking and walking and they get deep in Torah uh, in to, uh, discussion in Torah. And as they're walking, Elisha bin Avua, who's riding on the horse in Shabbos, something which is forbidden on Shabbos, riding on the horse in Shabbos says, Stop. Ad kan tchum Shabbos. Tol here is where you're allowed to travel on Shabbos. So Rabbi Meir says, Wow. You are a man that has rebelled against Torah, you rebelled against Judaism, and you're telling me. Why are you telling this to me? Obviously, it still means something to you. Yes, you may have done terrible things, you may have murdered, you may have broken every law in the Torah. But look, it's still, you still care about things. Why don't you, Chazorbach, return? Return to Judaism, return to the ways of the Torah. And he says, I can't. So he says, I don't understand. Why can't you? So he says, the reason why I can't is because there was a heavenly voice that came down. It says that everybody is able to repaint and do Teshuvah except for Acher. Except for Acher. Now, the... Who is Acher? Acher means the other. So let me give you a little bit of an... Uh, how is he called Acher? After he started his sinful ways, Elisha ben Avuah once came to a prostitute and said, I would like your services. So the prostitute said, hold on a second. You the great rabbi, Elisha ben Avuah. So he went and he does this, this act that is totally against the Torah and he shows, look, do you think it's me? It's not me. It's, he breaks the law of the Torah. So the prostitute says, oh, okay, Acher. It's somebody else. Acher, it's another. And that name sticks with him. And from then on, the rabbis start calling this man, instead of calling him by his original name, Elisha, they call him Acher. He's an other. Going back to our story with Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir tells him to repent. And he says, I can't because of this heavenly voice. Now, there's two Talmuds. There's the Babylonian Talmud and there's Jerusalem Talmud. The one version says 
that it said that everyone can repent except for Acher, and the other one says everyone can repent except for Elisha ben Avua. So, this is what his this is this is what had happened. There's a, f a fundamental concept within Judaism, and this is the I suppose the the topic of what where we were going tonight, and we'll talk about this last episode as well. That within Judaism, we believe that everybody has the ability to repent and change their ways. We saw that with Menashe. We saw that with Kaganovich, who was this evil person, and the Rebbe said to him, "He can do tshuva. He can repent. Anybody can repent." Now, Acher was a person that had come from the highest of levels. Elisha ben Avua. He was a great rabbi. Yet, he'd fallen to the lowest places. And he says, the reason why I can't repent is because a heavenly voice had says, except for me. Now, the Rebbe says as follows. Going back to the Rebbe. The Rebbe says that this is what he said. The Rebbe, the Rebbe said the heavenly voice was not coming to tell him that you cannot repent. The heavenly voice was saying, as long as you consider yourself Acher, somebody else, the other person, this person that has fallen into the sinful way, the man that has gone and lied with the prostitute and murdered people, that's when you cannot repent. You cannot, Acher cannot repent, the other cannot. But Elisha ben Avua, but the original you can. This was a fundamental concept within the Rebbe's teachings. And you saw that with this evil man, Kaganovich, that, 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 uh, that Zach spoke about, who was a person that the Rebbe knew about, lived in his lifetime and persecuted his own Hasidim, his own family. His father was persecuted by this man. And the Rebbe said, even he can do Teshuva. So this was a fundamental concept of the Rebbe's outlook. And when I say it's the Rebbe's outlook, I believe it's not just the Rebbe, it's, it's a fundamental concept within Judaism. The story of Elisha ben Avua, this, this rabbi that becomes a heretic, ends in two versions. One version is that he repents because ultimately he realized that it was only because he'd considered himself somebody else, this evil person, and that's why he couldn't that, that's why he was struggling to repent. And the other opinion says is he never saw that he could ever change himself when he dies as a sinner. But could he have repented, yes, even despite all his wrongdoings? I want to take us back to one last individual. And then we'll try to bring it all together. This individual is definitely not in the category of anybody else that we have spoken of tonight so far. As far as we know, she's not a murderer. It's a, it's a woman that are not considered befitting a Jewish woman. What's her story? Make correctly. Her sto Sorry, oh, I'm getting crackly. Is it still crackly? Is it good now? It's good? Okay, let me know if it gets crackly again. The last person I'd like to talk to you about is a woman by the name of Miriam Basbilda. So, we're going now to the times of the Hellenist Syrian Greeks. Just prior to the Hanukkah story, the Hashmanon. The time is the Second Temple era. Antiochus, the evil ruler of the, um, of the Greeks, has banned circumcision. If a person, if a mother is caught circumcising their child, then they are killed together. If um, they banned the keeping of Shabbat, the study of Torah to a certain degree. And any time a Jewish woman wants to get married, they first have to be, uh, so to speak, lose their virginity to the Greek generals. 
that's what's going on at this time. It's a terrible time, and that is what ultimately re uh, um, results in the uh, the rebellion of the Hashmanoi family, the Maccabees, and that's where we have the Hanukkah story. Now, the Hashmanoim, the Maccabees, Judah the Maccabee, and Matisio from the Hanukkah story, they were of priest descent. They were priests. They were Kohanim. Now, there's another family after the Hanukkah story known as the, the Bilga, the family of, Bil, of Miriam Bas Bilga. Well, what did the Talmud tells us in Tractate Sukkah? The Talmud says about this family, the, these priests, that they never had, they were somewhat abused by the other Kohen and the other priests. They never had their own cubby holes and locker, locker holes. They weren't allowed to have their own weeks. The, the way it was, it was divided by every week. It was a different family from the Kohenim. They always had to join with other Kohenim. There was a place where they kept their knives, where the Kohenim had lockers for their knives. They weren't allowed to keep that. And why was that? The reason why their family was treated this way was because of their ancestor, Miriam Basbilga. What had happened with Miriam Basbilga? Miriam Basbilga was a woman that had lived through the Greek oppression and abuse. She had seen her sisters and family being abused and losing their losing their virginity to Greek generals. And she saw terrible things happening to the Jewish people. And she does something which the Talmud says was unique at the time. She goes and she marries a Greek soldier, a Greek general. And the Talmud tells us, why do we know her name? Because she was unique. She was the only person. Yes, people became Hellenists, but nobody went and, and married out. Nobody married out. I know it's, it's somewhat of le less of, a, of an issue today, but in those days it was very, very rare. Extremely rare. Sorry, not less of an issue. It's more common today. In those days, the Talmud says it was extremely rare. As a matter of fact, she was the only one that did it. Now, that's a terrible thing. From a Jewish perspective, especially when she's the only one. But why was her family penalized, tells us the Talmud. The reason why her family was penalized was because when the Greeks marched, marched on Jerusalem and they conquered the temple, they walked into the temple and they put pigs there and the idols, all their Greek idol, idols. This woman, Miriam Basbilga, walked into the temple with her Greek husband, general. She took off her sandal and she snapped the, the altar where they bring the sacrifice. And she cried, Fox, Fox! Sorry, Wolf, Wolf! You eat, you consume the, the, the money of the Jewish people, but in the time of need you're not there for them. And the Talmud says, because of this disgraceful act of Miriam Basbilga that she went and she hits the 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 the, the mizbeach, the altar something that is something not allowed to be done her family lost several privileges the priests of that had now is that a strange story to you it's a strange story i'll tell you why it's a strange story because this woman did several terrible things the least of which was going and taking your slipper and hitting the the altar so what I'd like to show you, if, if it's going to work, I'm going to try to see if I can get it to work, is a short clip of the Lubavitcher Rebbe and how he looked at the story. So this story is always looked at by many, by most, as the rabbis ridiculing Miriam Basbilga. You'll see the Rebbe had a different look. And this is ultimately the outlook that the Rebbe had, as you saw in the story of Kaganovich that Zat was talking about, and Menashe and Elisha and all these people. You know what? 
I don't know if you're going to be able to hear that one second. There's some background noise, Mendel. Can you hear it? Yeah, there's some strobing or something. Yeah. Um, I can't even hear myself. Yeah. So that's strange. That's strange. Okay. It's not working. Oh, one second. Yeah. Sorry, could you hear that? Can hear it, hear it, but we can't see it. You can. Sorry, what did you say? We can hear, but I can't see it. I don't know if other people. Sorry, I'm gonna try one more time. I thought I had it before. You did. Can you no. see now? That's so strange. One more time. Let me see if you can see. Otherwise, I'll just tell you the contents, but it's much more powerful when you see it in the original. Sound is no good. Hello? Hello? Good evening. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. I th I, I'm assuming that I must, my, my internet connection must have just gone really weak. Now, a little while ago, your screen said uh, Mendel Haller's band is low. Uh, having some, I've got three different internet yeah. things over here, and they're all not working well enough. Okay, so I'll just tell you, just to conclude, I'll, 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 it seems like my internet's not strong enough to share the video properly, so I'll, I'll tell you the content of what the Rebbe says. The Rebbe says like this, you have a woman that as far as we know, she's broken every law in the Torah. And not only that, she's joined the enemy, she's married the enemy, and she's joined the enemy in the fight against the Jewish people. And what is the rabbinate penalizing, what are they penalizing the... Um, what are they penalizing the, her, her descendants for? Not for the fact that she... Not for the fact that she went against and joined the enemy, but because she hits the altar. So the Rebbe says something extremely powerful. He says like this. The Talmud was actually trying to teach us something essential about what it means to be a Jew. You could have a person that has left the Jewish people, has joined the enemy lines, has come and fought against. But you know what? What do you see with her? She, you would have thought that she doesn't care, but what does she do? She takes, and, and the Rebbe says this, 
In the video I wanted to show the Rebbe starts crying. He breaks and he says like this, Lucas, Lucas. And he breaks down, the Rebbe starts crying in that video. And he says, here's a girl that's left all the Judaism. She has seemingly no connection. But what's she crying about? She's crying about her fellow Jews. She's crying about the state of how they can be abused and how you can teach to the Jewish people this way. The Rebbe said, why, were the, why was the family of the Kainim, why was that such an important thing? Because ultimately, what did it show? The story of her hitting the altar showed that no matter what had happened to her, no matter how far she had gone, she always had an essential bond with the Jewish people. And what ultimately she really cared about was her fellow Jews. And the same concept applies to every single Jew no matter how far they may have seemed to have gone, no matter how lost they could have become the Kagdanovishes or the Menashes or the Elisha bin Avuz, but ultimately when you're deep, far down in it, you deep and you peel away all the layers, you would see that deep beyond everything is a fiery flame of a desire to be connected to their fellow Jews and to God and wants the goodness of their fellow Jews. So, to 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 sum it up and bring everything together that we've so, uh, that, that we've heard tonight, we, we uh, Zach and I decided to purposely visit some really trouble troublesome individuals, because as people individuals or they live in a westernized secularized society, where people that have done wrong tend to be um, called evil and lost and monsters. Yes, it's true, people do bad. People can, have, can cause bad to do others. Nevertheless, that's just my computer playing up, so somehow I've changed my back screen. <laughs> I've just gone to another place. I've gone from the beach to, uh, back to my office now. Um, as individuals, we have the ability to fall and do terrible things, but they should never uh, they should never define us. We are never Acher. We are never that other. We're always Elisha, Elisha ben Avua. We are always that that Elisha person. We're always that Miriam Basvilga, the woman that as far gone as she had gone, she ultimately was the child of Israel. Kaganovich may have abused and done terrible things to people, and yes, he should get punished for his terrible acts. No one's denying that. But to say that he's lost and that he's a monster and there's nothing good left in him, we can never say that. The lesson for us is a very powerful one. The world likes to get all caught up in the flare of oh this person's done this terrible act and therefore they're lost they're an abuser they're a criminal they're a murderer and that's true but doesn't people have to get punished but we can never ever ever lose hope on anybody never believe that a person has too far gone that they can't return and if we can be believe that about people that have actually done bad but real bad we most certainly can d believe that about ourselves. We tend at times to define ourselves based on what we've done, based on the lives we've lived as being people that are, oh, I'm not religious. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, that's not me. I don't, I, I, I wasn't brought up that way. And we start to live in this identity that we've created for ourselves. The powerful story of Acher, of Elisha ben Avua, is that when we define ourselves not consistent with who we truly are, then we start to believe that. And the lesson of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, as we come into those days, as we come back and we hear the shofar sound, it's in order for us to remember. The shofar is the cry that we are never too far gone. That we are never lost. And certainly none of us have done 
anything equatable to anybody that we've mentioned in tonight's saga. So we want to bench and wish everybody may you be written and sealed for a good and special year, a sweet, tangibly good year. And may we all only know of happiness and goodness and believe in ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you again to Zach. Um, that's the end of tonight. Formal parts. Um, so everyone wants to join. If anybody has any question for myself or Zach, please feel free to leave, to to uh, ask. And if anybody wants to go and they, 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 they we put them to sleep, we've already put several people to sleep. That's fine. Um, then don't feel obligated to say that the, the class is officially ended. Thank, hey, you. thank you both for your presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Bad it, but what does it say there, Michelle? Ah, it's your wife. <laughs> We were on a different Zoom and somehow I lost my name and it switched back to me. It's Michelle's computer. Right, yeah.